I love that song we just sang. There's a kind of a country twang to that song. Plus it has some rich, rich lyrics. It kind of, kind of gets me. Because God, you could just leave me here. We could just have this little thing going between us and, and that would be enough. But you want to send me somewhere, you want to grow me somehow, and I resist that, but you've got to do it. Don't want to miss it. Love Davis. Do you? Love Woodland. Love Winters. Love Dixon. Love Sacramento. Well, some things are maybe too hard to. <laughs> West Sac. You can handle, you can handle that. We are doing this series because we believe God has called us to love our neighbors. That's clear. That's one of the two great commands. Love God. Love your neighbors. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. And most of us love ourselves a lot. We prioritize ourselves. We take care of ourselves. At least we should. And we are looking in the scripture this month at uh, a number of cities. One city each week that we find in the Bible. Because we're looking for, for clues as to how we can live as faithful followers of Christ in the city. What's our relationship like with that city? How do we appreciate the city for its gifts and its virtues? And where do we feel like at times we need to challenge the city? So today we're looking at the holy city at Jerusalem. Next week it will be Corinth. And the week after it will be Athens. And then finally the fourth week it will be Antioch. And Antioch becomes a springboard for a worldwide mission. But that's coming later on. Jerusalem, the holy city, the city that three major world religions look to as their holy city, all coming out of the scriptures, beginning with the Hebrew Testament. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, we see this verse, and uh, it's a simple verse, but it's a powerful declaration by God, a representation of, of God's um, um, will, and that is, he says this, but now I have chosen Jerusalem for my name. God always begins with the particular. He begins with an individual. He begins with a tribe. He begins with a nation. But his goal is universal. He wants his glory to be spread. He wants folks to know the good news of his love. He wants us to understand how it is we're supposed to be treating each other because we belong to him. But he starts with a city. And it's supposed to become contagious. I've chosen you for my name. I've chosen you to reflect my character. Now, that's God's intention, but there's no entitlement here because when Jerusalem strays from its original mandate and is no longer reflecting the glory of God and becomes corrupt, as it says in 2 Kings, I have rejected the city that I've chosen. That kind of sends a chill down your spine. You mean it's not automatic? You mean it's not guaranteed? No. God can withdraw the light. He can withdraw the blessing. He can withdraw the, the, the favor. And he will send you a prophet to remind you of your hypocrisy and how you've gotten away from what you believe. And that can be kind of painful. But still, God hasn't given up. The fact that he's sending you a prophet means he has remembered his covenant. He has remembered his promise. This is his will. This is what he wants for you. But he's calling it a task. He's calling you to accountability. And, uh, you know, we, we, we like to apply that word to other people. We, rare, we rarely ask for it ourselves. I want you all to hold me accountable. Uh, that sounds like a campaign speech. But is it, but is it really what we're, what we're asking for? And when they're held accountable, and when they do respond, and when they do, biblical term, repent, which means they turn around and go in a different direction, and they're sorry for straying from God's plan and his relationship, and now are ready and willing to confess and ready, ready and willing to, to make things right, God shows up with a roar and empowers them into this new season. So, if you go on into um, Isaiah chapter 65, for example, you'll hear that it is God's intention to create a city, Jerusalem, that will be a delight to everyone on the face of the earth. You see, it isn't just his desire to create a holy city, whatever that whatever image conjures up, but a city that's going to be an attraction to, going to be compelling for other people who look at it and say, and that, and that is often what happened, as people looked at the Jews and said, who is this God that they serve? 
Who is this one that has such righteous standards for his people? Who is this God who rules above and beyond the chaos? Who is this God who comes from us, comes to us from somewhere else with a word that we ourselves could never conjure up because it's not self-serving. Somehow it, it turns us out toward others and turns us into a different kind of, of person, a different kind of community. And so people were drawn to Jerusalem at times, and then they would fail again to listen to God, and they would go their own way, and God would send the prophets again, and on and on it goes. But then we come to Jesus, who shows up in Jerusalem in the first century. And of course, he is the one that was prophesied. He is the coming Messiah. And in Luke chapter 13, we see him standing in the middle of this city, the same city, the holy city, Jerusalem. And there's an agony in his voice as he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. There's no contempt in this. Yes, he's upset. Yes, perhaps there's even a, a, a touch of anger here because, because Jerusalem is resistant to God and resistant to the one that God sent. There's still a longing for reconciliation, for a renewed relationship. Um, you, you feel that. There's a tenderness in the appeal here. Even though there are positive things about Jerusalem, in fact, one of the reasons that, that, I was, uh, I, that, that we chose Jerusalem is that in Jerusalem, the theme is, is righteousness. It's a, it's a people committed to righteousness. Now, we don't use that term often in, in, in the modern day. The word might be responsibility, as in doing the right thing. Um, if it's possible, I want you to play the video because we have wandered out into the streets of Davis. Yes, we have this past week. And we have asked people about their view of righteousness or right living. So let's take a look. Here it comes. This is Emily Mazzarello recording from UCC. We're going out to Davis on the streets to hear what people have to say about certain things that we're going to talk about in our Love Davis series. Today we're going to ask the question, what comes to your mind when you think of the phrase, doing the right thing? Doing the right thing when no one's looking. Morals and justice, kind of. Being nice. Kyle Thompson. <laughs> doing the right thing is doing, acting in such a way that after you've acted, you're like, you feel all right about yourself. Well, that everyone respects each other. Following your internal uh, moral compass, really. Standing up in the face of uh, criticism from your peers or criticism from authority. Just knowing in your mind that you've done the best you can. See a piece of trash, pick it up, don't throw it on the ground. Speaking out if you see something wrong or helping someone in need. Well, for me there's a big difference between doing what feels good and doing what feels right. So it's thinking of something larger than yourself. That's good. I'd love to have more conversation with some of those people. I, I uh, thought the guy, one guy looked pretty relaxed, <laughs> lying in the hammock. Um, I appreciated the, the older guy who said, uh, be nice. <laughs> Wasn't quite convinced that that was his specialty, but uh, um, to, to, to be righteous, to do what God wants is, is, is the way we would think of that inside a church conversation. But out there, in the, out there in the, on the streets of Davis, doing the right thing. Well, as it turns out, there's a lot to affirm about the culture of Davis and its desire to do the right thing. You think about being environmentally responsible. You know, we might call it more theologically creation care. God made this world. He made it so beautiful. He made it to work a certain way. His first, one of his early commands is tend the garden. Enhance it even. I've given you creative skills. That's a beautiful thing. We care about that here. We care about justice in a general kind of a way. We care about the poor and want them to be doing better. And so we provide lots of ways of helping. We're Davis, so we do a lot of problem solving. Um, at the academic level and in other more practical ways, we do that. We share our knowledge. People come from all over the world to learn from us about agriculture. 
um, about veterinary medicine. We have a law school, we have a med school, um, we have uh, uh, an emphasis in international politics. All of that is going on and all of that is good. In fact, one way of loving a city that you're in is finding out what is good. The fingerprints of God, whether it's acknowledged or not, and, and, and celebrating them and affirming them and, and joining them and being partners with them. So that's a good thing. But as we know, there's always a shadow side. Even with the virtue, even with those things that we appreciate and would celebrate, there are things that, that concern us. Now, now, what happens? Well, in the first century version of Judaism, we still have a concern for righteousness in Jerusalem. We have a, a political party, a religious party called the Pharisees, and they are the most righteous of all. But what has happened? There's some kind of distortion that has happened because as you become more righteous, more concerned about doing the right thing, you actually become more humble because you realize this is big. This is we've got a lot of work to do still. Um, we're we're not satisfied with what what we have done. We want to do more. This is harder than we thought, and we need help to do this. But instead, in that time, for those people, and sometimes for us now, we become a bit self-righteous, like, see what, see what I've done, and see how good it is, and I've kind of joined this, uh, maybe unconsciously, this competition to make sure that, you know, I, I, I'm accomplished, and even if I'm not totally accomplished, that I look at least accomplished. And there's a bit of posing that goes on, so a kind of self-righteousness, a kind of pride can take over. I don't mean that that would ever happen here in Davis. But it could, pride that then leads to a sense of superiority, and there are errors that go along with that, and people sort of sense that in each other. And sometimes we join that race, and other times we're repulsed by it, and say, I want nothing to do with it. But now the emphasis is off the right, doing the right thing, and it's more about you know, looking good, and making sure that you're on top, and you can become slightly judgmental, or more than slightly, towards those who haven't accomplished, towards those who haven't achieved. So we have to think about that because when you love somebody, when you love a community, you affirm what's good. I mean, you don't need flattery because flattery is not an example of love. Flattery is, is lying and basically it, uh, um, you know, it's sort of your way of, of I don't want to tell you the whole truth, so here, here's, here's a little part of it. I'm going to exaggerate it. But you tell people what you actually see that, that, that you know is good and it's going on. And then you are willing to challenge them. You're willing to offer a loving critique, even a loving confrontation, if that's necessary. We come into the, the book of Acts now, chapter 2, and the church is born. So how does the church live in a city? And the first city they lived in was Jerusalem. And how did they interact? Well, the church was born on a day called Pentecost, which was an old Jewish feast, and now kind of transformed by the experience of the risen Christ. There were staying in Jerusalem during this time, at this, uh, during that same day, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Something is going on. Well, at Pentecost, people from the Jews who were part of the diaspora would come back to Jerusalem, and they were part of this celebration. Davis has a way of drawing people from around the world, from, from every nation. And we recognize that as a good thing. Again, something that we celebrate, something that we affirm. It opens up opportunities for new relationships and new learning, for sure. And our, our heart should be tuned into that. It's a very stimulating place. It becomes very cosmopolitan. And that's good. The diversity that God has created and wants us to discover is here. This is a great laboratory for that. But it's possible for us to become proud, for us to become self-righteous. And really what happens beneath that then is we start feeling a lot of pressure. Do you ever feel that pressure here? That pressure to keep up, that pressure to perform, that pressure to rise to a certain level of education. Uh, and when you rise to that level, now you've got to rise to a level above that level because it's, it's never quite enough. And there's a lot of pressure that way. And I know because people tell me about that. The longer I'm here, the more I hear about that. And there's a lot of busyness. You have to stay incredibly active, involved on so many fronts. If you have children, they have to be involved in so many um, 
different clubs and organizations and sports and music groups and all of those things, which are all good things. But there's a stress that's created by that pace that's kind of frenetic. It's difficult to sustain that. And people um, tell me about that as well. And maybe the hardest thing or, or the worst thing is in such a place, it's possible that you would be encouraged to put on a facade, to keep up appearances, so that you look like the ideals you're supposed to represent. And people come to me, and um, they'll tell me what's going on behind the scenes, what's really happening. And I didn't see it, because it didn't match what I saw. It wasn't the same as the appearance. What's going on underneath? What's going on deep underneath? Now, if we're going to be people who love the people around us, especially the people who are susceptible to these kinds of pressures and stresses, we need to understand that. Not get angry about it, not feel judgmental toward it, and, and not blame people for it, but recognize that they're struggling with it and maybe don't get know how to talk about that. And we need to talk about that. We need to do something about that. And, and people need forums for that kind of conversation. Now, what happens? It even happens on a Sunday morning. You and I walk past each other, and I say, hello, how are you? You say, fine, how are you? Which I don't answer, because that's the protocol. And we're two ships passing in the night, or on a Sunday morning, or whenever it is. I mean, try this sometime. Try actually answering questions. When someone's walking by and they say, how are you? And they say, I've had a really rough week. Watch them freak out. <laughs> because that's a violation of the social program. Because you're not supposed to tell me that much. I'm not looking for that much. Now, I'm not saying that every time we have to answer that question literally. But sometime we should. Because the truth is, when you ask me how I am, I wonder if you really want to know. And I'll probably assume that you don't have the time, probably not the interest, maybe not even the capacity to hear what, what's going on in my life. And I would have to know that, that you would care, that you could handle it. Because, because if, I, if I think you might, I might take a chance. I might actually tell you. I am fortunate enough to have a few friends who will not accept my fine as the answer. So how are you doing, Doug? I'm doing, I'm doing great. No, really. No, really. Let's, let's be real here. How are you doing? And I know they have the time, and I know they care, and I think they can handle it, and uh, um, I don't feel so alone when someone actually takes the time. So how do, you, how do we love people around us? We, um, we take the time and show the interest. We don't have to have the answers. Um, we don't have to fix the problem, even though that's a little bit of, of our culture. Hey, we, we can fix it. We're, we're really smart people, probably the smartest people on the planet, the truth be told. <laughs> but you don't have to know the answers. But you have to care, and you have to be willing to stop at least once in a while. I'm not saying every time. I'm not going to get legalistic about this. There's a new righteousness, self-righteousness that, that might take over if we did. But, but to develop a kind of sensitivity that love actually does teach us about, and a kind of creativity, and, and, and a kind of priority that says, this is the most important thing. People are the most important thing. Relationships are ultimate in the kingdom of God. Yes, I have tasks to do, and I must get them done, but this is more important. This moment trumps that sign. Otherwise, I like those People that walk by the man by the side of the road. The story, the parable that Jesus gave. Don't want to be that person. They were on their way to church. My gosh, I hope nobody ever has an accident between here and the Bay Area on a Sunday morning. Because I can't afford to stop. Because what would you do without me? Probably have one of the greatest services you've ever had. I'll hear about it later. What are you missing? What's invisible? A few weeks ago, the uh, high school group here, the youth group, asked me to be part of one of their uh, kind of fun nights. It was called Most Wanted. And uh, several of us were identified. We went out, and we were supposed to disguise ourselves and sit somewhere in plain sight in, uh, in Davis, in downtown Davis. And they were supposed to find us, you know, and get our signatures and, you know, and all that. So 
I have this pathetic disguise of a cowboy hat. Like, you're not going to know it's me, okay? So I sit down outside Cold Tea Day, you know, that little yogurt shop, and uh, the first couple of groups that went by, they spotted me right away, you know. <laughs> Here I am. But then I got into a conversation with uh, a man who lives on the streets, and uh, we sat at a table together, and we kind of sat close to each other, and we heard this conversation. Groups walked by us, and I was, I became invisible. They didn't see me anymore because we're now part of a, we're in a different category. And finally, this one group passed me the third time. I couldn't help myself. I stood up, took my hat off, and said, I need some attention here. <laughs> and they never had any idea it was me until, in, in, until that moment. And I think a whole lot of people are saying, I need some attention. I need somebody to pay attention. Don't buy this disguise that I'm wearing. That, it, that, that I look so good and everything is going so well and I'm so accomplished and I'm fine all by myself. I'm not necessarily fine all by myself. In fact, all by myself is a signal that I'm probably not doing very well. Are we willing to pay attention? Back in the book of Acts, chapter 2, I think we're at verse 14 now. It's going to come up any moment on the screen, a man of faith. <laughs> so Peter stood up in front of this vast array of international folk. Stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. By the way, notice the irony. Peter, when we last saw him, was cowering in the corner, not even willing to acknowledge he knew Jesus on that night, that fateful night before his crucifixion. And now, somehow he's found his voice. He's got a new courage stood up, raised his voice, addressed the crowd, fellow Jews. Notice the, notice the language there, the semantic. It's a, it's a language of solidarity. I'm one with you. I'm another one of, of, of this tribe. It's not you Jews, you people. There's no distance here. Fellow Jews. He's embracing them. And all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain all of this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Explain what? Well, all these people by some miracle, are hearing the Word of God, the good news about Jesus, in their own language. And they're coming from a variety of places. Now, it's not my purpose this morning to talk about the miracle of translation or speaking in tongues, but the principle behind this is, if you want to love people, you have to learn their language. You have to learn their culture. You have to find out about them and their story and their history. If you want to get to know Schumann, you have to know something about his background in India. He was born there. You have to know something about um, his uh, trials and tribulations in the Midwest. Ski Wisconsin. Um, you have to know something about the amazing and beautiful history of their family and how it was put together. There's a lot you have to know to establish a relationship, and he with you. And uh, there's no shortcut to that. To speak someone's language, to take the time to find out about them, opens up the door, builds the bridge. Peter's doing that, and all of the disciples with him, and they're committed to that. They're giving themselves to the city, and it's a big risk. They don't know what the response is going to be, and sometimes it's favorable, and sometimes it is not, but that's who they are now. Um, they, they belong to this love, and to this loving Christ that they worship, that they serve. And then at the end of the passage, Acts chapter 2, what is the church doing to serve, to love this city? End of chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, okay? You ground yourself in the truth. You have to know who you are. And to the fellowship, the relationships with each other, to the breaking of bread, we're going to do that in a moment, and to prayer, constantly in contact with God. Everyone was filled with awe. Were you here last week? Anybody here last Sunday? Remember the folks we had? who were here with us? Were you in awe of the transformation taking place in their life? These guys who are returning from prison, long sentences, terrible backgrounds, and God's gotten a hold of their life, and all you can do is you just want to hug them, you just want to listen to them, you want to learn from them. And they were here as a gift to us, filled with awe. Many wonders, miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. Wow, a unity here. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. 
uh, double wow. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, right in the middle of the city. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, there, there was a book written a half century ago that's still very, very powerful, a classic really, called Christ and Culture, written by Richard Neighbor. And there were four paradigms, four ways of thinking about our relationship between us, those who believe, and the city we live in, the environment that's around us. The first is Christ, the Christ of culture. In other words, you simply blend in. And no worries about compromises because whatever the culture is doing, that's what God is saying, is one and the same. That actually prohibits you from loving people because you're bringing nothing new to them. The second, the opposite, is Christ against culture. I grew up in that. Culture is the enemy. The world outside is, is, is dangerous and and frightening, and you build a fortress and you live inside of it. And uh, if you communicate with those people, you're scolding them. And as uh, much as possible, you have nothing to do with them. Obviously, that prevents you from loving people. So that doesn't work. Then there's a third paradigm, Christ above culture. I think that's a big temptation here in David's a big temptation among us. I want you to think about that for a moment, because what it does, it divides reality into two spheres. Here's the real world during the week, and here's your spiritual life. And uh, this is kind of a hyper-spirituality. And I believe in all this, I just don't apply it over here. I, I live aloof from the world. This is secular over here, this is sacred over here. This is um, um, uncomfortable to, to, to mix these two. There's a great wall here that divides them. So I live kind of in, this, in a schizophrenic way. You know, science and faith. Can you, can you put them together? Well, no, you can't. So science is over here. Faith is over there. I believe in both, but I don't, I don't carry on any dialogues because I don't believe there's any connection. And I'm actually a little embarrassed because I don't think this really works out there. can't bring this to the campus. There's a fourth paradigm, which clearly is the message of the Bible, leading up to a full understanding of what it means that Christ is transforming the culture. Christ transforming the culture, which implies engagement. We're not we're in the world, we're not of it, we're not defined by it, we're defined by our allegiance to Him, but we're engaged and we're bringing what we are learning in a very practical way, a very down to earth way, believing that this is what the world needs. Again, not that we have all the answers, but we're carrying Christ with us, and He's going to make whatever difference He decides to make, and He's going to love this world through us. And finally, this community becomes a preview of Revelation chapter 21, the last passage I'm going to throw up on the screen. I want you to read it with me. Listen to these words. I saw the holy city. There's Jerusalem again. The holy city, never quite living up to its promise during history, but the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. God has not given up on this city, though it has betrayed him in many ways and, and compromised its own integrity in so many ways. But God has a vision of a new Jerusalem, this holy city, and all of these people who are part of this city. And this new Jerusalem now comes down in the place of where the old Jerusalem was, and heaven and earth converge. We're not going to heaven. Heaven's coming to us. Coming down out of heaven from God, beautifully dressed as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with humankind. Always God's intention. And He will live with them. They will be His people. And God Himself will be with them and be their God. What is the intimacy? Not only between us and God, but us and the people around us. As we live in this network called the city. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. We should be doing that now. We're the preview of this. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We are people who minister hope to the people around us because all of those things, those hard things, those painful things are part of our reality right now. But in the name of Christ, we cry tears. And we sit here with people who are crying, with people who are in pain and in mourning. And we mourn, but not as those who have no hope, but those who know what God is about. And we have a chance to minister to the city. We have a chance to love babies. We're going into a time of communion now. And uh, 
I want to invite you to take this message to heart. To be in love your name. To wave as you leave in the morning might be, might be a great opening. How about to ask a follow-up question? How about to bring a gift? How about meet a need? How about find out about their children and how they're doing? How about invite them over for dinner? How about take them out to do something fun together? How about find out when you haven't seen them for a while what's going on? How about all of that? As we get ready for communion, um, how many of you have heard of Neighbors Night Out? Okay. How many of you actually live in this area? And don't keep you from the Bay Area like I do. Okay, so you know about Neighbors Night Out here in Davis. And the, the, the Donickers have been hosts for this event. And I want to give you one practical way to respond. Chris, come on up here. Grab that microphone and see if it's working. It might be. All right, tell us about, I don't trust you. <laughs> tell us about this and how we can participate with Neighbors Night Out. So Neighbors Night Out is a organization run by the city. And it's an opportunity for the neighbors in Davis to get together and to get to know each other. So it's an easy thing to do. I sign up every year. Um, we have neighbors come in that are new and they don't know. There's obviously students out there that are new and they don't know how to connect. There's a couple ways that you, or there are actually three ways that you can get involved. One, if there is an opening, and there should be, right, uh, it's October 12th, so there is opening for hosts. And a host is simply somebody who puts door hangers and the city gives them to you and just says, hey, we're gonna meet over here, and we're either gonna do dinner or durs or ice cream, whatever you, whatever you think. If that doesn't work for you or your neighborhood already have a, has a host, then call the host or try to find out who it is and participate. Ask them how that you can help. It's super easy, and if that's not your venue, then show up. So show up to get to know everybody, um, it's really important. I found it was very important for maybe security reasons. Not that Davis has a big security problem, but you're going away on vacation. Now you know the neighbors. You know, they're watching for you. You're watching their dogs when they're on vacation. You're giving a meal. When there's new people in the neighborhood, show up with cookies. People like that. He's in East Davis, by the way. Um, this is just some type of love that you can do for your neighbors and to get involved and get to know um, because I guarantee you they need your help and you need theirs. So even if you're not a vivacious blonde, you can do this. <laughs> even if you're not a real estate agent or a vivacious blonde, you still can do this. Okay, well thank you very much. We'll be looking forward to this. Okay, yes. And if you're not a host, help out the person who is, who is the host. We're invited now to a time of commitment, really, a time of communion. And uh, I want you to think about what this message means to you in this moment. What is God calling you to do? Not remain aloof, not be against, not simply blend in, but to respond to his call, to engage at a really deep level with some people around you, perhaps people who have been this point, up until this point, almost, almost invisible to 